Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. You're listening to the Q&A portion of the lecture that I gave or the presentation really that I gave at the 2023 Kalamazoo Living History Show. This is going to be really ad-libbed Q&A from the crowd uh, both days that I gave this presentation and this talk. So the first half of the questions are actually going to be from Sunday. The second half of the questions, you'll notice the audio is a little bit different, is going to be from our Saturday presentation. I'm sorry that the audio quality for this isn't as uh, isn't really up to par with the rest of the podcast that we normally do, um, but getting the question askers on microphone was a little bit more difficult than I anticipated. So I've bumped up the levels. It's going to be a little bit more crunchy than you're used to, but I hope that you can still find the information in this episode uh, informative. As we go into the next couple of weeks here, we'll be back to more of our traditional interviews and topics of conversation. I just wanted to get this out there. I had a lot of requests to make this available, so I, I'm happy to do that, and I hope that you enjoy. And like it's, it's those kind of concepts that we can propose to people and show them that totally redefine what they've been told or, or how they've been influenced to think about who we are and what we do. But by publishing this stuff, we push back and we change the, how the culture thinks about us. So that's why I've used the term culture so much, because this is a culture. To me, this is American culture. It's my family culture. I hold on to those family guns because that's what fed my family so that I could be here today. And everybody has that. And if we connect people to that, that's it. You can't fight that. You, 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 just, you just can't fight that. And so that's how I look at it. I look at it as, if, as much as I can to publish this stuff and get it out there I mean, the nightly news, however you want to think about it, whoever's pushing up against what we're doing, they can't fight that because I'm just a guy that loves this. That's the only motive I have. I just love it. And we need to make sure that my kids and my great grandkids can enjoy it the same way I have. So that's a little bit of a tangent. I'm sorry. That really wasn't <laughs> that was kind of ad lib, but that's that's kind of where we're at you know, as far as my presentation goes. Yeah. Well, the big thing is like the 1619 project. These people are, are crazy, they're, they're idiots, yet they, they, they condemn all of us because we came from Europe over here and did all this stuff. Yeah. So you got to fight these people who are insane in their thinking and try to mitigate them to, to a point where they understand, but they don't understand. But they're a, they're a definite obstacle for all of us to do our... I, I, I understand where you're at. I've, I'm not super familiar with that, but I, I understand what you're talking about here. I want to propose something to you. Instead of seeing it as an obstacle, find a, we need to find a way around it. And, right. Exactly. So, so what you have in your pocket, I, I remember um, we, we have some time here. We're going to for our Q&A here, but another anecdote. My grandfather was a photographer in the Army in the Pacific in World War II. When the smartphone camera came out, we tried to show him what it was, and he was asking where the film came out because he, he just couldn't comprehend it. But that little phone in your pocket is literally a pocket TV studio to publish things and to go and use it. When I come to an event, I have a backpack that has broadcast quality equipment in it for me to come out and show people this stuff. Without a filter, without a lens, this is just what it is. This is just who we are. When I talk to people here, it's just you know, their neighbor or the guy at work you know, or, the, or the waiter or the waitress that owns the local restaurant. We're just normal people. And by sharing that as much as we can, I, I'm a very private person. My, my home life, you know, I, I try to keep that very private. This has kind of grown to be much more than I thought it would be. But by getting out there and sharing, again, that passion and what we love about this, to me, that's a direct um, functional, uh, productive movement against what you're talking about. And not really against, this is kind of the, to the side. Like, um, I get some feedback from, from groups like that from times that try to frame me in a certain way. And I do my best just to sidestep it. You know? that's, not, that's not who I am. I, you're not going to define me, I'm defining me and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it by what I'm doing. And I'm pumping out more stuff in a positive light about what we, what we all love than they can cast on me, is how I look at it. I try to be cagey in that regard.
I don't make any money on this. I sell some t-shirts. I'm an artist by trade. I work a nine to five at a... Um, so like the, the t-shirts and things that I sell, I sell them because I made the designs and knockoffs were coming out of Southeast Asia. And I thought, well, if, if people are going to buy these, I might as well make a couple bucks than people who stole my art. <laughs> um, so I don't run any ad charges on promoting events because I want to see this continue. I don't want any hindrance for an event starting up and doing that. So let's talk. Let's get on the podcast and talk about what you're doing and, and share it with some people because that's, that's what I'm here for. So my game is I am looking. The reason I'm here is I need four people. I'm one of them four. To understand that shtick, which is the song and dance, we're going to teach you history of humor. Because like this gentleman is very lively. But history, I'm going to be nice about it. It's boring and old and dry for most people. Unless you go to one of the living history events like this. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm going to be drawing from the public. Four other catalogs, they'll be in the other view. But this is a historical reenactment celebration. It's a weekend warrior thing. I was originally going to do four months, 124 days without eating one of my fellow paddlers. <laughs> we got to get along. If that fell apart, that's great. So now this is a weekend warrior thing, which is even better. Right. So it, jumping off one of your points there, I, I, I need to add it into this presentation, but making it, uh, making onboarding simple. What, what makes Townsend so successful is they're talking about, especially right now, the time travel series is fascinating to me because they're framing modern foods that we all eat in what our ancestors, how they could have ate something similar. And it's, it's everything, all the other food stuff that they do is very similar to that, but this is like a hammer just hitting you on the head, connecting you with somebody 200 years ago and what they would have eaten to eat something like that. And by showing those little slices of life, showing those little windows into our community, that's what is, what is approachable. Going to a, a, a club competition or something, going down to the NMLRA range during a nationals is very intimidating because you have the best of the best down there shooting and you have hundreds of them lined up shooting and they all know what they're doing. But you, you have to start a little bit earlier to get them to that point. And by going down to those basic core newcomer ideas, you make it approachable so that somebody can come in and say, okay, I can put on those shoes or I can wear capri pants, which is all these are, you know. I can do that and I can get involved. And then you have that touch point. We had a lot of questions yesterday about uh, mentor-mentee relationships and, and how we can help get people going. Consider yourself the best search engine of muzzleloading and living history. Don't tell somebody to search for it. Tell somebody the way you do it and why you do it that way. If you like a specific brand of powder, when somebody asks you what powder to use, that's your opportunity to make sure somebody else uses that powder. I mean, that's a really granular level of it, no pun intended there, but it's easy to get a bunch of answers, but people aren't gonna have a connection with the answer they find on Google or on Bing or whatever. When somebody asks you a question or you see somebody asking a question, that's an opportunity to, for you to be the mentor that you had or that you wish you had to bring people on. And so even if you don't do anything on the internet, I don't care if you don't do anything on the internet, still consider that why do I do what I do and what do I love about it? And take it out to an event like this. You see a newcomer, take it to your club or your other local events or just somebody at Walmart, if you see them with a flintlock on their gun and they seem approachable. You know, don't go invading people's lives, but just say, hey, nice flintlock on your shirt because they're either gonna say, I don't know a lot about flintlocks and you have an opportunity to talk with, to them about it. Or they're gonna say, yeah, I'm." love flintlocks, I just don't have anywhere to go. And that's an opportunity for them to tell you, for you to tell them about your club or your group or, or however you want to look at it in this community, if that makes sense. I'm talking a lot, but I want to make sure that it makes sense. Question. At this stage in my life, I try to resist technology just because I, I would rather talk to people than go on the internet. When I get home tonight, I will not look at anything or talk to anybody for a couple days. I, I understand where you're coming from. Please so, continue. Let's see, this is the thing. I'm a life member of an NMLRA range off an instructor all my life. Yep. I've been for 30 years. I've been a friendship and everything. And because of the organization I'm with, I belong to a group called Royal Rangers. Uh huh. Yep. And, and part of that is the Frontiersman Canyon Fellowship. Yeah. Okay, which has had a, a Great Lakes region and it was a friendship a couple years ago. 
and I ran the range. Like I said, it was a blast for me. Okay, so what, because of changes in their leadership, the old guys are stepping down. Yep. Okay. It's happening all over the country. I know, and it's really techy. Okay, I'm not techy, all right? But I'm going to put on the first ever muzzleloading camp in May, okay? And so, Thank you. So this is one of the things that I need to get, you know, with techy people, you know, including my 18-year-old granddaughter. To, and I got an iPhone. Yep. And to make advantage of this to be a success, to get them out of the boat and into the water. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the things that you said, because I have an Instagram account, but I don't do anything with Instagram. Okay. I, know yep. you, I see YouTube and I do times and all that. Yeah. So I'm quite the history buff since fourth grade. Yeah. I can tell you about my family being in Yorktown with Washington. Okay. So it just, I, I go ways back. So I need to get personally to get over that resistance to use technology. Because the old traditional way of putting in a poster is not going to work. I would argue that they work in conjunction. Okay. So if, you, if you're planning this muzzleloader match, or in the, teach, this camp, sorry. Teach 12 years old, male, female, how to shoot a plan. So in, in conjunction with the social media stuff, every local hardware store, local diner, every place that you go and shop, if they have a poster board or something where you can tack something up, Absolutely, tack a flyer up there. All the farm stores around where I'm at, yeah. A couple months before your event, start tacking those up because the people that are interested in this are buying stuff at the hardware. They're working on their own house. They're fixing their plumbing, you know, they're renovating. They're doing that kind of stuff because they're hands-on people already. And if they see that that's happening in their area, they're gonna go and do that. I, If it's the kind of thing that you're interested in, I can, um, Try to work on this kind of presentation or something to put online to on, on some tactical best practices stuff on how to do what you're talking about doing. Um, for me, it's as simple as going and, you know, um, there are guys like the Orion Foundation, um, Valley Reb is a big guy, the, the Townsend's um, channels, obviously. There are big people in this space that are out there doing things. Just look at the, the hashtags that they're using when it comes to a muzzleloader camp and just copy them. Post some pictures of what you're doing, post your flyer on there, and there, people are gonna start finding you. Called Steel from the Mass. Well, I, yeah. I ran the Sassafras Survival Camp where you show up with a pocket knife and you're going to work for three Okay. Years. You know, so I've been, I, I've been doing that. So I've run camps for Royal Rangers for 30 years. Right. You know, so it's just that, but if this, talking about legacy in history. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the biggest issue that I can do Cooper Kinton back to 1680. You know, so it's just, you know, it's just that getting the young people today, okay, because it's all this. I need to learn how to tap into that. Exactly. If that's where they're all, that's where they're at, we need to be there sliding into those feeds as they're scrolling. That's the only way they're going to find us. So here's a phrase called unscrewing I like that. That's good. Yeah. That's from Bucks Up Memory. Okay. Well, we're going to use it then. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, two years ago, I joined my uh, my events board uh, of directors. Uh, Thank you. In, uh, West Michigan. Okay. Um, it's like a small event, but I was mainly brought on. Event. Well, I was born and raised in Grand. Oh, there you go. I've been there since forever. There you go. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I was mainly brought on uh, as a younger person yep. uh, to kind of usher in interest for the younger public, so a lot of what this presentation is. Um, and last year, I decided to start a podcast in conjunction with Wonderful. the decision and the event. Uh, it was initially going to be... Uh, to draw interest for the event and for that era specifically, but then, you know, looking around, I was like, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of traffic of that already, and so since then, I've kind of like rebranded it as just reenactors and living history in general, keeping those personal stories alive and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I guess.
guess the question I do have is for somebody young uh, who is interested in living history, uh, but as a young person, I can also look at like some of these fantastic people, yourself included, dressed to the tens. Yeah. That that sticker shock. Yes. Gets to a lot of young people. Yes, it does. Uh, what would you say to them? Because me being a young person, I don't know what to say to them. <laughs> Are you talking clothing? Yeah, clothing specifically. I clothing. Okay, I've been in clothing competitions for thirty years. I can put you in an outfit in less than twenty bucks. I to to piggyback off of that. I tell people to start with the cool stuff. You know, okay. I. <laughs> well, something is, I, well, I really tell people to start with a book about their area of interest and, and really start there. That doesn't actually help you. And it's kind of a non-answer. Well, but the, the, the thing that I've been telling people, uh, the few chances that I've been able to, is, uh, you know, uh, some of my ancestors were French, uh, French voyages. Yeah. So that's, that's the route I took since my event really centers around uh, French voyages, and we don't have, we only had one. Right, you don't have a lot of representation. Of it. Yeah. Right, so I was like, okay, well, there's my in. So, and luckily it's a relatively cheap topic, but. <laughs> um, nobody's gonna care if you're not dressed to the tents. Right. If you're not, if you're not wearing, you know, uh, like right, right now I'm, I'm having a, a short coat tailored, hand stitched, it's for me. You know, nobody's going to know that, I mean, yeah, I can look at somebody and tell them if, if they're wearing something off the rack. I'm not, it doesn't, I'm happy that they're here. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of, a lot of that trepidation is a, a, is a more personal hurdle, I guess, in how we think about how other people perceive us, um, which is something that, that person has to sort through. Yeah. But I think um, to come down to like a tactical thing that they can do, coming to an event like this, I can walk around and I saw half a dozen full haversacks of equipment that you could go out and camp with if you wanted to tonight that somebody had, they're selling from their collection, they're downsizing or it was a friend for 50 bucks. And to buy new would be $150, $200. And it's, it all looks great. It's all aged, it's all been used, it's perfect. It's, you just kind of have to be out there and kind of search out for that stuff. I mean, there are uh, probably almost, there's really a decade of photographs of me helping at this show as a young guy. I just, you know, I'm wearing the cheapest stuff possible because I was growing all the time. And it's something that you work on. I mean, these pants are seven, eight years old and they start to look good now because I've cut them up, I've got them dirty, you know. Um, going out and you can wear, you could go and purchase the cheapest stuff that you can find. And if you spend a few weekends a year using it, it's going to look great. Mm -hmm. You're going to look, you're going to go from, you know, dressed at the threes to dressed at the eights like that. Does that help at all? Or is that, no, okay. Are there, are there sites out there that have outfits for sale that people like? All yeah. <laughs> Facebook is... Going back to the Facebook group side of things, I have to stop myself sometimes because the, like the reenactor swap groups or the buy sell trade groups, there's so much neat stuff that gets moved around for nothing. Like no, if you wanna outfit yourself right now and you don't have a Facebook account, get one just to shop those groups because you can find, thank you so much for bringing this up because you can find those same bags and things I'm talking about that are fully set up for 50 bucks, they look great you're going to find them on those pages. People just need to pay attention to the prices. Yes. Yes. And don't get drawn into the super expensive stuff. Exactly. Don't, I, yeah. I think the issue with us younger people is we look at going into this hobby, um, the finished product of those who have been doing this for 10, 20 years. And yeah, you, you get that like, oh gosh, that, that was, gosh, that's like ten thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah, we got to remember we started. Right. With it, you know? Right. And, and but that's that's the conversation. The idea for your podcast would be to take somebody who's been doing this for years, if they have pictures, right, when they first started, 
here's what I look like going through. Right. And it yeah. took me 10 years to get to this point. And you can label those pictures. Then they can see it and they can go, oh. Yeah. And something else that I think the younger gen and myself included deal with is a, a sustainability of that investment. This stuff does not lose value until it is tattered rags. If you are a young person, you get into this stuff and you use it for a while, and you know it's not your thing, you're not, you might lose 10 or 15 bucks if you wanted to resell it. And really, if you, if you put that dollars to hours of enjoyment out of it, you can rationalize that expense really quick. And sometimes if you've used it really well and it looks patinaed and aged, you can sell it for more than you bought it for because you want to come in, you know, myself included, I'll buy something because it's got the look that I'm looking for. I want to hang it on the wall and think, yeah, that came out of the woods and it's been sitting there for 200 years. Is there a, a need to get the message out to the younger people that the more experienced people don't care if they're perfect? Yes, there is a, there is a, a bad perception uh, it's an inaccurate perception, I should say. It's built in reality. People do have bad experiences, and that is something that all hobbies and all communities are fighting right now. But I think we are seeing that leaf turn over. I don't know if it's people getting out of it or people not being as active, but that is a perception that we need to deal with. And I think that comes back to the mentor-mentee attitude. And even if it's going into some of the groups or... Uh, you know, being at a local church bazaar with a table for your club or something, getting out there and telling people, I want to help you. I want to, to guide. I'm not, this is a no judgment zone. You can come in here with an old CVA or an old Thompson Center. doesn't matter. I want, I want to get you involved. I want to get you to be a part of this. I just wanted to tell you that I have some tremendously good ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm old, but I'm fairly new to muzzle loading. Did yeah. Cowboy action stuff and things like that. Um, it's a shame that Facebook has taken over internet forums. The internet forums preserve the history of conversations much yeah. better than Facebook. But they're still there. Uh, not so much on Facebook, but on those forums and also in some of the shoots that I've been to. I've observed most of the people there are guys my age or older and mm -hmm. we're a crotchety bunch. Yep. And we're not always welcoming to newcomers as we should be, both on the internet and there. So one of the things that I would say, just as a participant, you know, I'm kind of like, yeah. I want to know more. Um, we need to be nicer to people that we see coming into the community. And, and you know, I'll speak for myself and for people my age. Instead of saying, hey, do a search to find your answer, we need to answer the question. Because when someone comes with a question, they're excited and they want that answer now. And we're in a generation, the younger generation especially, they, they want immediate answers. Yeah. And it's a chance for interaction. Absolutely. That we're missing out on. Think well, about I Instagram. I haven't done it yet. Please do. Kind of piggybacking on that, you can tell somebody just to search for something. But how many of you have searched for something online and found exactly what you needed? when you wanted it. You find something else. I, I, I want to rephrase that. When somebody asks you, instead of telling them to go search for something, become that mentor for that person. Influence, I mean, if you like one brand of such and such over another, now's your chance. Now's your chance to make sure that brand loyalty continues. I mean, even at, just at that basic level, if you like a certain reference book, and you don't like another one, you know, if you know the researcher was just blowing smoke on a book, don't let that newcomer find that blowing smoke and, and take it and run with it. Point them in the right direction first. You know, you can't, you don't want to trust the big tech, you don't trust, you don't want to trust Google to guide that person. You want to be that person that they trust, and that's going to build that relationship that they're going to actually come back to. It's easy to tell somebody to go buy the Traditions Hawken because that's the affordable introductory gun right now. It's, it's harder to have that conversation when you have it a few hundred times a year about what to get into, but those moments are so important because they know that when they get that and they're at the range for the first time, that they can shoot you a message and figure out how to get that thing going. Or if there's an issue, they say, man, my caps just, my, you know, my main charge wasn't going off. Oh, you need to make sure that you're, you're picking the nipple. That's something that Googling, they're going to get as much as I love the forums, they're going to get 10 years, 20 years of bickering about what's the best such and such. And that's a, that's a really...
prohibitive introduction to the community. Um, sorry to totally hijack what you're saying there, but yeah, I, I think you know, one of my points there is, is you know, just be kind. It's, it doesn't cost anything to be nice, and you know, use that opportunity to guide somebody the way that you were guided or that you wish you were guided. So you know, I'd like to, like to use is agree to disagree. Yeah. That way you, you don't make enemies or, you know, you don't say this guy's full of whatever, whatever. Yeah. Another big thing that's, that concerns me is, uh, as you, you know my history, uh, a, a young, young guy will shoot a black powder at the U shoot for the first time. He'll say, wow, did you see the plane come out the end of that? You know, that was really neat. And, you know, of course we're against the, the ARs and stuff like that. Well, you know, I could pull the trigger 15 times and have 15 rounds downrange, and I, I can set it in the corner and not clean it for three weeks. Well, I can't do that with those muzzle loaders. Right, and that's where those that's where those basics of things kind of have come back in. And I think what I'm seeing is because there's so much for people to do now. There's so much interesting stuff out there for them to do. You almost have to onboard the work side of it to them. You need to expose them to the cool part. Maybe let them shoot your stuff, let them sit around and watch the cleaning. And then after the third or fourth trip to the range, it's like, okay, now it's, now it's on to you to clean. You know, we don't, because you need to. You need to clean the stuff, and, the, and especially the safety side of things is super important. But we don't want to come in with that hammer and just bop them on the head when they don't clean it, you know. Which I know you're like that, Bob. I've seen you work with kids and, and people of all ages, you know. You're, we seem to have our hands tied. Uh, and from what I understand, I haven't been to school for a long time, but we're not teaching American history anymore in our elementary schools. And I was brought up with American history and Ohio history. Mm -hmm. and we learned all about the Indians and the Cheyenne, the Shawnee, and so forth. Yeah. And that really interests me. And that's what started the ball, ball rolling. Um, now, you know, where can I find caps? Where can I find flints? Where can I find powder? You know, You're right. Got, I've got all the equipment, but I can't make it go bang. Right. <laughs> so, and so in a lot of cases, we're not, you know, we can't do more than what we can do. Yeah. Right. And I, it gets, it gets tough, because I, I hear that a lot too, you know. And I'm able to to do research that I would love for everybody, you know, especially young people, to get engaged with and be a part of, you know. To that point, I mean, my mother's a public school teacher. She's a history teacher. And I know that there are teachers out there teaching. You know, they're, they're still holding on to this stuff. And they're really passionate about it. We can also make our voices heard on that kind of stuff. You know, get involved with your local school boards and your local, you know, education boards, however you want to look at that. Just like if you, you know, want to see a muzzleloader hunting season, like in Kentucky, they're trying to get a flintlock season going. We have to get active and, and try to pass that influence on. And I think using some of the stuff that I've talked about, the what and the why, is a really hard thing for a, for a school board or an educational committee to argue about because it's foundational to who we are and where we're at, you know, as a people. And it's really important to teach that stuff. I think you'll see that pendulum swing back. I hope that we see it. But I think it's also important for us to, just as we consider getting active in preserving and, and continuing the community, I think even locally too, getting involved with your education process and things is just as important. What do you think on that, Bob? You think that's? Um, no, you're good. I lost my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot what I was doing. I lose mine all the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Am I nuts? Thank you to your wife for letting you make your <laughs> content. Uh, I'm an avid consumer. Well, thank you. You're partially to blame for this interest I have. Well, good. That's what I want to hear. That's what it's about. You know, she's back there in the corner very patiently with our baby. Thank you, Paisley. Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm here all week. Yeah. The same format that you've chosen and the same bullet points are the same techniques 
that people use in other groups, yes. such as churches. Yep. You see this a lot in churches, and especially in churches that are floundering. How do we get? How do we save the church because their membership is yeah. getting older and people don't attend? This is all so the same techniques. I'm. I can speak for myself. Um, I, I'm an AA person, mm -hmm. but these are the same things that we do in AA. Yeah. That we got a newbie here who doesn't know anything about how to be sober. Yeah. You know, in fact, he may even be drunk when he comes to a meeting. How do we help him? Yeah. Uh, it's all about helping your other fellow man, and I'm probably not politically correct, but how do we help somebody? That's what it all boils down to. Yep. What's our methodology? What, what do we do to, to help them out? Yeah. You know, that's what it all boils down to. I don't claim for any of this to be pioneering or inventive. I'm, I'm applying, like you said, a lot of the same things that we see out there in other communities, in other cultures that are working. I'm framing it in the idea of muzzleloading and, and applying it to the history that this community has. And that's, that's really it. You know, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. You're exactly right. You see this being applied, and you can apply it to just about anything. I mean, I have people talking to me about model railroad clubs trying to do this kind of thing, RC car clubs, the same kind of thing, model plane clubs, churches. And that, that's why I, 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 that's why I talk about it in a kind of a cultural sense. Um, I think it is a, it's culturally important to the American identity because of our American history here. Um, and I think it's important. And there's a lot of other people out there that think it's important too. And I think there's a strong group of people that are holding on to it because of that. You're very welcome. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. No, hit me. I think it is. I'm certain that it is. I mean, like, oh. I see MLRA, the Walter Klein range, you know, seems to be dying. But yet, on the other hand, it seems like culturally or, or in the media sense, we're, we're gaining more and more people all the time. There's, and that's why I talk about the, the, the tiers or the levels of engagement. Because there's a ton of people coming off the last five years at one and two, where they've seen it and they're interested in it, and they're getting ready to take the step to getting involved and attending those events. And that's why we need to get the word out and, and welcome them with open arms. Because they're there, they're primed. And if we don't see that continued growth, it's, it's on us that it didn't, because they're there. They have the equipment, they've, they're ready to go, they wanna go get involved. We just have to bring them in. And that's a hard task. I mean, it's, it's not going to be easy to get people out and get people away from work or, or you know, traveling. It's, there's hurdles there, but there are hurdles that other places and other communities overcome. Yeah, Tim? I think an important thing to remind people of is that have been in the hobby for quite a while. Is if you see an individual come to an event more than once, there's obviously the interest is there. Yeah. If you see them struggling or they're lacking something in their kit that you might have two or three of, it helps to give that person that item or cut them a deal on it to give them the opportunity that they might not have to further their impression or their kit. Um, and that will only help to grow the interest even more because they now have that positive interaction that will help spark that continued growth and eventually one day they might be in a position to do the same thing to help. And it builds that relationship. That, it builds that mentor-mentee stuff that we are all looking for and so many newcomers are looking for. I mean, you can walk down the aisles at, at, at these shows, especially the big shows, and you can see the really nice stuff. And it's really great. But there's also a lot of $5, $10, $15, $20 th powder measures, you know, or a little clip-on multi-tool, you know. Prime your pan. It's a... a your, <clears throat> it's a vent pick, it's a pan brush and things. I try when I'm at a show to, to budget some of that small stuff 
so that when I interact with somebody, I can hand that out. You know, and if you're in a financial situation where you can do that, that is huge. That is huge for somebody to, even if it's just a, a card almost, that's, it's just like, hey, if you want to talk about this stuff, here I am. You know, here's the thing to get started. They're going to look at that thing and they're going to remember you and they're going to know that you're there and they can go reach out and connect with you. And it gives you a touch point. Say, hey, have you, go, have you gone out and used that powder measure yet? Have you used that horn or have you used those tools? What do you think? You know, how'd they work for you? And it keeps that conversation going. You guys are awfully quiet here in the front row. What do you think? Okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm, I'm not going to badger you. That's okay. Uh, oh, okay. You got to get some extra credit, right? Extra credit? Okay. Okay. We can work with this. We'll work on this. I'm old enough. I learned a lot of the stuff in the Boy Scouts. Yeah. And they need people too. Yeah, a lot. A lot of those old guys. But I think you see a lot of the same cultural things affecting those kinds of things. The yeah. same things affecting Boy Scouts, shop class, FFA even, you hear about, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you came back in. What do you got? Oh, okay. That's okay. I thought you had another question. We're well over time now. You guys, you all can. You're welcome to go catch the rest of the show. <laughs> That's really all I had for the presentation. I'm, I'm more than happy to hear any feedback or anything. You know, if you want to come up and talk privately, uh, I have a table in the main expo. Um, with my father where I, there's some space to talk a little bit. So if you want to catch up, if you're here the rest of the weekend or something, or, or later today, you can find me out there on the floor too. Well, it's amazing to see you in person constantly. <laughs> <laughs> He's like all night. <laughs> He's here for more than six years. I, I need you to put the phone down, sir. <laughs> I need you to go out and shoot your muzzleloader, okay? <laughs> put the down yes. phone down and go to sleep that night. <laughs> These kids these days and their phones, they can't... That is with a 360 degree camera. So it has, it's a camera with a lens on both sides, as a fisheye on both, lens, on both sides. So it films like a 190 degree dome on either side and then computationally stitches that together. I am. I have it on a stick. And the, the computation, the, the crop where it stitches the, both cameras together, it crops out the stick. So if you look at my hand in that video, there's a line through my hand where it doesn't line up. That's how I did that. I wanted to do a, a trekking video where it wasn't go and set up a camera, walk back, walk in front of the camera, pick up the camera. I wanted the, my tracks in the snow to be the first tracks. And that's how I did that. Thank you. How can he, how can he get that? Where we can even, he <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you see a couple times that it ran into some branches, so. <laughs> yeah. Do you think we'll ever do an extended two or three day trek and videotape that? Yes. That would be a lot of fun that, to watch. That's something I'm planning on. Um, my family has a little bit of natural woods and, and tree planting that we've um, kind of taken back from cornfields and things over the years. My issue is uh, the ticks are really bad where I'm at. And uh, I have a lot of buddies that spend days picking ticks out of regions I don't want to pick ticks out of after going out for that kind of thing. So I'm trying to time it appropriately. Uh, really, like right now is the time to do it for me uh, if I want to get it done before the ticks come on. Make sure you're really sprayed out like three, four drops. Yeah. 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 I mean, you got to kind of buck up and put on the wool, but there's no ticks. So for me, I'd rather have the cold than ticks. There you go, yeah. Yeah. I hope to. I've got some buddies that are trying to pull me out. It's got to line it up. Yeah. We'll have to go out together sometime. Be happy to. Okay. Let's rock and roll. Interesting how they used to do it back in the, you know, the, the 18th century. 
what, what the heck did they do? I mean, sure, those people come down sick with uh, different diseases and whatnot. Oh, they didn't have well, you, you, you can read the accounts of, of some of those guys, yeah, where they were laid up for a winter, yeah. you know, I mean, just struggling. Or like the malaria, we had malaria. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Well, they, uh, yellow yeah. fever, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You suffered, and then you got over it, and you took off it. That's right. Or you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the fortitude is something else. Yeah, to live with it, you got it, though. Yeah. Oh, well. Right. Yeah. You live or die. Get out of here. Oh, have to go eat. Yes, sir. Of course. <laughs> What's your name? I want to, uh, my name is Glenn. Glenn, Glenn Spencer. Glenn, Glenn nice to meet much. you. Thank hey. you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. I really you appreciate you coming out. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm constantly <laughs> watching. I keep all telling people long. about you and all that. <laughs> Nurses, I'm going to come and <laughs> see you. <laughs> well, I'm just a guy, man. <laughs> I know you are. Okay, okay. You're very humble, and I appreciate it. Well, that's what it's about. Thank you. Just like with general. I need to tell them. It's like, yeah, I was a girl scout. <laughs> I'm Brian Newberry. Brian, nice to yeah, meet you. You actually used some pictures of uh, Kibler Woods Walker of mine. That oh, was, that's okay. One you one of the first guys that got it. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Oh, I love it. It's a lot of fun. I just did a woods walk with it last weekend. Okay. Did better than I've ever done with my other rifles. Fantastic. What caliber did you get? 54. 54. Yeah, Good caliber. To be lightweight and yep. also larger because those targets are really yep. small. So oh, yeah. So. It's easier to cut the card with that four, yeah. that five, four that's, that's the idea. So, yeah, I really love it. And Fantastic. It was, uh, it was a breeze to put together. It Good deal. Really trying to build a couple others, yeah. but uh, since that was so easy, I put them on hold and, and went with that. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. I really enjoy your, your stuff. I enjoyed all of your build videos. Thank you very much. I don't, have you ever seen the Woodland Escape? Yes. Hero tool? That was yes. kind of what? got me thinking, you know what? I'm kind of done with cowboy action. Yeah. Right. It's a little easy, but I'm building a log cabin sauna, and he was building his cabin. Fantastic. Like, yeah, this guy's kind of like me. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, they do great stuff. Oh, he, lives, he lives the life. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's a real deal. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun. What project do you have lined I up? I make here? knives. So okay. Like knife sheets. Knife sheets. Nice. What kind of knives? Every kind. Just, okay. You know, I forge yeah. them or grind them or okay. steel, whichever I feel like doing. And yeah. I haven't made any uh, historically correct for the period, but that's mm -hmm. the next project. So. Okay. Well, super. Do you have a gas forge? I do. Okay. Yeah. And also coal. Yep. Fantastic. That's awesome. Well, anyway, it was Thank nice you very much, you. Brian. I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> what do you think? Like I've said before about this presentation, this is kind of the first public step for me in doing something like this and, and bringing how I've been thinking about this for a few years now out to the public to really get some feedback and, and get some notes on how we can improve this and, and how we can structure this to make it more useful as we move forward. This is by no means the only way or the best way to do anything, you know, as I'm talking about here, but I hope that it sparks some ideas or sparks some thoughts in you on, on some things that you can apply to your club or your event or your business. Um, I think together the muzzleloading and living history community can really make sure that all of this continues. Like I've said before, I don't think that the community is necessarily under threat of, of, of growth, really. We've seen a lot of growth over the past two and three, four, five years. It's just up to us to keep those new folks interested and keep them involved in the community. And I think we can do that together. As always, if you have some feedback, if you have some questions, some comments, or some thoughts about this presentation, shoot me an email at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to, to add your notes and, and discuss this with you a little bit. Really, the best part of the presentation for me was the conversations that it sparked after each time we gave the presentation and then the conversation I was able to have out on the show floor with many of the folks who attended. So really can't thank the Kalamazoo Living History Show enough for having me and allowing me to kind of give this a little bit off the wall presentation, I think, compared to what many were expecting, but I think it was received well and it was really a lot of fun for me. So I hope you enjoyed. As always, thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time.